climate change is not going to face us. Um, so with that, welcome today to uh, Planeurs, Fascists and People Smugglers, which is of small boats and long walks. We've got with us, as you all know, Simon Paul, uh, who's been a regular attendee at our cafes for the last three years, I looked it up. But now he is the star of this world himself. And for the purposes of tonight, Simon is a walking performance artivist. I'm not sure if I've heard this before, but now you have, so I've got an artivist. He is a writer and storyteller, and his core social practice is co-creating spaces to connect, create, share, and debate. Sometimes provoking questions around emotive or difficult subjects like climate change or neoliberal cities, he would like to facilitate personal transformation and social change, helping us all move just that little bit further down the path through working conversations. His primary method of sharing two dates has been part scripted, part improvisational performative group walks and talks conducted for a decade, conducted for a decade, made in the east of London, not in South Africa, but east of London. Uh, going, um, um, yeah, running wow, both local yes. and uh, global projects and back again, or running locally, globally, and back again. They explore everything from radical local history and contemporary gentrification, globalization, and the consequences of resource wars. All topical. He's a polyglot and he brings decades of alternative travel experience from around the world to whatever it is that he's doing. And in his own small way, he would like to challenge stereotypes and prejudice. He also encourage, encourage us all to be brave and acknowledge our political shadow. Now, in 2019, as you might have seen in the introduction of the uh, event for today, a chance remark sent Simon to Spain, where he replicated the final walk of the great 1930s intellectual Walter Benjamin. Um, and Simon had heard before that of Benjamin's name often at talks on psychogeography, but he knew quite little about the man himself, uh, who is, as we roughly know, or at least some of us certainly know, closely associated with the arcades of Paris, as well as with the concept of the flaneur. Um, and that walk of Simon became a portal into an ongoing illustrated journey, which he will talk to us about today, into the world of refugees in the shadow of Europe and its borders, finding that the past very much parallels the present. I'm going to hand over to Simon in 30 seconds or so. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions or uh, remarks, interjections, suggestions, you are probably fine just to throw them in there when you feel like it. Uh, if you don't want to do this, you can also put them in the chat. Um, and uh, you can also raise your hand with the raising your hand button or physically like this, and maybe Simon, or otherwise I will um, call on you to throw in um, need to throw in your question. Now, I'm also going to ask you, because I'm the biggest perpetrator here probably of this uh, grave sin, to mute yourself when you're not speaking in a loud room. So I'm going to mute myself and hand over the microphone to Simon. Simon, it's yours. All righty. So hopefully you are uh, going to be seeing what I'm seeing, which is, uh, are you getting the full screen? Yes. All oh, right, fantastic, good. Okay, so this is no, what no, I no. do. No, no, we're getting the present, the, the editing screen. You have to switch to present. You're, you're sharing the window, not the screen. Oh, yeah, doing that. Yeah. Oh, oh. Hang on, uh, but it's on the same thing as I was sharing before. Okay, stop sharing. Sorry about this, guys. Uh, I literally just pressed pause and thought I could resume there. Uh, so you are sharing, it says I'm sharing that, the Walter Benjamin. Ah. Oh. Uh, slideshow. So you, you're you not seeing Found in Transit? Yeah, we got it. No, we are. But it's not full screen. But it's okay. I would I would say just go for it. Let's go for it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, sorry about that, guys. I thought I thought we'd nailed that. Uh, so, um, boom, bada bum, bada bum, bada bum. Yes, thanks for the uh, intro back. Um, and thanks to uh, Faversham Literary Festival for um, showing up to support again. That's very much appreciated. So I'm going to kind of... Um, there's a lot to get through. I'm not going to give you the actual um, show that I'm working up because, uh, as I've said, it'd be more interesting for you guys, I think, for the, the process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to – this is uh, a work in progress. This is where we're at right now with it. You can probably tell that is me, wonderful art by uh, Clapton illustrator uh, Sarah Fink. 
So uh, a little bit, I'm going to give you a little bit of background to me and how this comes about, because if I have a methodology, because I don't really know what I'm doing, uh, it's kind of intuitive, then uh, this is relevant. And maybe some of you will actually, who know more about this kind of thing than me, will actually be able to tell me what my methodology is at the end of the presentation. So um, I had, uh, I've had a split life. My second life began in 2005 when the 9 till 5 and being settled down, all that thing went out the window and I went around the world for the first time and I went on all sorts of adventures. I became uh, a, bar a diver on the Great Barrier Reef and then in 2009 for Runner's World, I covered uh, a run to mark the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, in 2009, so that was 20 years from the, along the German section of the Inner Deutsche Grenze. Uh, so I had lots of adventures. I ended up in Bosnia, where I found myself in Mostar and Sarajevo, and I went to a refugee camp and did a bit of writing, a bit of freelance writing about that as well. And uh, I took kids all over Europe as an educational tour guide, mostly American kids, very exciting because I would see Europe afresh through their eyes, but I also got the most incredible education, Versailles, umpteen times, the, you know, the, the Sistine Chapel with guides telling me the, the history as they saw of their nations. And then when I wasn't doing that, I would backpack um, around Europe. This is before now. I'm a, I'm a little bit more. I'm not as proud as I was of this uh, to say I've been to 47 countries. Of course, now we know much more how pressing the environmental situation is. and We can't go on like that. And I've massively um, reduced my carbon footprint and try to fly as little as possible. And so I'm spending time in East London where uh, I'm doing all sorts of interesting things. But along the way, I also went to Burning Man, I went to the Spanish Burning Man, and I did an art residency where I created um, this uh, reproduction of what I'd felt and experienced in East Berlin. And this is, kind of, I guess, this is my methodology, is going and traveling and talking to people and taking in loads of things and it coalescing into something that I want to somehow express. And this was an installation I made. And a guy from Argentina said, that captured really well what it was like to live in under the junta in a repressive regime, even though I'd modeled it actually on the Berlin Wall. Found myself in Hackney, East London. I was doing conventional tourism, but I've always been interested by what's going on in the cracks, what's not being told, the stories that you don't hear. The silences are often more telling uh, than the, uh, you know, the words and the the whole spin of the, you know, exciting, regenerating East Berlin and East London. Um, and so I was, you I'm know... jump in, in there for a second, Simon. We're still yeah. only seeing the first slide. Was this intentional? Oh, right. I'm scrolling through them. Ah. Oh. This is... Sorry about this. Um, so I'm sharing, I'm sharing the presentation, but you're not seeing the scrolling. That's... Wow. That is so... Uh, no, we're not. Stop sharing and try sharing again. Oh, okay. So I'm going to, okay, I'm going to stop. Sh Sorry about this, guys. Um, so into blue jeans. Okay, so uh, into screen sharing. I'm going to choose the desktop screen, yeah? Yeah. Yep, now we see two windows. Now, okay. Presentation um, now I'm going to go into view, uh, view slideshow. Looking good. Now start scrolling. Yes. Okay. So sorry about that, guys. That's the Grenz and Las Verona across Germany. Um, that is uh, Mostar. Uh, that's shot from the literally from the front line where people sniped at each other. That's where the ethnic Croats sniped at the um, ethnic um, Muslims, the Bosniaks. Uh, that's me, tour guiding in East London, replicating what I've been doing around Europe. That's the Berlin Wall installation in Reus in Spain. And here I am uh, in Hackney, exploring the cracks, or what's not being said, and finding a different story to the glossy, you know, come to exciting East London and East Berlin, and then going around the block a few times and finding out about property greed and planned gentrification and, and the commodification and instrumentalization of culture to raise property prices. Uh, I started doing a bit of activism as well because my friends were being displaced and landlords were are getting away with absolute murder. This is a conversation you can hear in San Francisco, in Hackney, in Bushwick, in New York. 
in Barcelona, in Leipzig, and da, 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 and so the so the list goes on. I did an immersive walk uh, when I found out, and this is again, if I have a methodology, it's just walking around, following my intuition, and being drawn to things. And when I found out that there's a train that literally connects East London to um, the far side of China. Um, the Yi Wu, I thought that was absolutely fascinating that there are continuous metal rails and all of a sudden the resource use uh, and, and abstract things about climate change, you can make them concrete because you can track these containers and you can see where they've come from. And all of a sudden it's like, it's not out there in the, in space, you know, um, you can, you can trace and track these things to the other side of the world. So that was an immersive walk. This was something we did at Portland with my um, partner in crime as Promenade. And this is the excellent poet, Jessica uh, Taggart-Rose, who's also appeared at Faversham, actually, because she's also in Kent. She's in Margate. Crowdsourced walks, uh, bottom up rather than top down. And I'm moving here. The trajectory is moving away from the original tour guide idea of, hey, guys, I'm the expert. Everyone's got to listen to me. Uh, to, oh, hang on, everyone in this room has got experience, has got ideas, and maybe between a lot of us, we can come up with something that's much richer uh, and much more intense than just me, you know, sort of it's active creation rather than passive consumption, which kind of mirrors what you see in places like Hackneywick, like East Berlin, when the artistic community gradually becomes people who, are, you know, are consumers rather than creators. Not their fault, by the way. Um, I went to, so I'm, I'm doing, you know, what I, what I will later realize is I'm psychogeography uh, and I'm exploring it. And I go to the uh, fourth World Congress of Psychogeography in Huddersfield. And uh, an amazing revelation is someone explains to me what the rhizome is. And this ties in, I think it's quite Benjaminian. It's this idea that everything is uh, interconnected and, and you can't put things in neat little boxes because there is this big, massive, non-hierarchical knowledge and these little trees that we make, they're not, they're not real. And I haven't even read any Deleuze and Guattari. And to be honest, I probably won't read any Deleuze and Guattari, but I think this is the sort of thing they might be getting at uh, with in their books like A Thousand Plateaus. So I'm in East London, I'm looking in the cracks, I'm interested in the stories that are not being told, the displacement, uh, the, the things going on in the background, and asking people big questions, inviting them to think about, so what sort of city do we want? Because one of my problems with conventional tourism was that if you're just repeating these things, people say, oh, well, it's not political if you just repeat the history. Well, who wrote the history? What does the history include? What does the history leave out? Uh, and so I'd be like, everything's political. You know, we established in the 60s, the personal is the political. So I want to, what's the point of those stories and that history if we don't take it and then use it to reinterpret the present and then think about the future? So what sort of East London, do, who is it for? And, and what do we want it to be like? So I'm going to um, William Blake's grave looking for inspiration. He is, I think, um, Ian Sinclair described him as the uh, godfather of psychogeography. So there's some dots joining here. Maybe some of you can uh, already see those dots, lines and tracks. And this is one of my mind maps. This is William Blake and it starts off Blake in the center. And if you go down, for example, to the bottom right hand corner, you've got free love. Um, this is where I end up. Everything is interconnected to everything else. And to me, it's quite Benjaminian in the sense of his, his unfinished arcades project, which basically, how can you, how can you, is, is there's a twain where when you said, when you take it, try and take a, a, a word or a phrase off the page, it brings all the other ones with it. How can you separate all these things? And Benjamin's legendary project turns into a history of Paris in the mid 19th century, um, rather than just a description of the, of the arcades. So it speaks to me. Lines, tracks, nodes, uh, cerebral um, networks, neural networks, all roads lead to Rome, but for Walter Benjamin, they lead to Paris, all railroads lead to Paris. And I use this as a, as a metaphor for the, or a visual analogy for the brain. Um, and I was led to Paris following the footsteps of Walter Benjamin. But before I got there, there was another project I was doing, and I know I'm kind of rattling through this very fast, and obviously this is not how I would present this if it was a, a show. Um, 
like I did at Faversham. But I want to show you the, the methodology. Now, another project I've been drawn towards, again, just intuitively, was smugglers and the people that tried to stop smugglers in the 1700s. And so um, I was walking the paths that the smugglers had used in the past. And then, of course, I realized that these paths are still being used today uh, in many places by a different kind of smugglers, by people smugglers. So I'm on the south coast of um, Kent, and I'm exploring this uh, so-called uh, the, 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 the invasion that were under by refugees, which when you look at the data, just falls apart. And it's absolute nonsense. Um, and I went down there, and of course, I saw uh, very little. Um, and it gave me a, I had a flashback to being on the Walter Benjamin walk, which I'm, I'm going to talk about. And I was like, here I am again on a, on a smuggler's path. And again, thinking about fugitives, the people that chase them, about the psychogeography you see there, this is the Kent coast. This picture is um, about a year old, but look at that. It's a Junkers 87, a crashed one. Uh, in the background is a hurricane. And so myths, ghosts, resonances, palimpsests, all that thing, the layers, it's really rich. Um, this is alluding to World War II, the Battle of Britain. But if you know your um, art, mythologies, then there's also uh, Joseph Boys is in there with his crashed bomber as well. And that was made uh, deliberately by, I think, by a, a German sculptor. So, uh, by the way, you know what? I forgot to tell you, didn't I? I forgot to tell you that I actually found Walter Benjamin's missing briefcase. Now, this is quite important. Um, now, I can't actually see myself on the screen. So can you see the suitcase? Can someone tell me if you see the suitcase? We see the suitcase. Oh, great. What have we got in here? Guys, we've got all sorts. We've got, um, got a tricorn hat. Yeah. Uh, we've got, a, uh, we've got a, a book about Walter Benjamin, a, uh, a graphic guide. Uh, we have got binoculars, surveillance, watching. Uh, we have got a, um, oh, a little set of postcards about flaneuring in Paris in uh, Ah, there you go. In the early 1900s, we've got a um, book on psychogeography. We've got a tea towel that says, uh, help Ukraine. And what else have we got? Oh, we got, oh, we got a life jacket as well. So what are all these things, all these props? Oh, we also have a bag as well, should I say, from the Ukrainian post office that says, you... Russian warship. So uh, what are the links between all these things and the story that's unfurling and unfolding now? Well, as I said, I was walking uh, the cliffs at Dover, getting involved with volunteering with refugees and finding out, and this is another element of, of my methodology um, as I see it, which is going to see for myself because the media gives us such a distorted uh, representation of what's going on. There, there are all sorts of agendas. And, and just that, you know, when you've been around the block a certain number of times in life, you realize that the, the official representation of events and how things actually unfurl can be very different things. Now, a chance remark by a friend sent me walking uh, back in 19, uh, 2019, and this is what I was flashing back to when I was on the cliffs at Dover, to a walk I'd made in the footsteps of Walter Benjamin. It was all very random. Um, I didn't know anything about Walter Benjamin, really, apart from what I'd, I'd seen his name mentioned a lot at um, events like the Fourth World Congress of Psychogeography, the festival in Huddersfield, always in connection with the flaneur, which now I realize I have been a flaneur, and I now realize what a very privileged um, uh, position it is to be in. And the flaneur is not always a very positive representation because it's a bubble of privilege where you float through the world and you know very slowly and other people are too busy working and feeding themselves and you're typically white male middle class so you can pass unmolested um through these these spaces that other people wouldn't necessarily uh, be able to do and a friend said you could go and see if you're in spain in catalonia and you've got time to kill which i did she said you could go and see the walter benjamin Monument. So, oh right, okay. I didn't. I didn't know there was one, but something about it kind of hooked me. 
And so I said, yeah, I'm, I'll do that. On my journey, uh, and this is, again, this is that thing of things that are around, joining dots and things insinuating themselves into this story. This is the Kinder Transport statue at Liverpool Street Station, and I would pass by it quite often. Um, and I would start tours there as well. And I was reading about people like Lord Alf Dubbs in regards to child refugees in this ongoing media storm of this rhetoric of invasion. And, and you know, this is the stuff that Gary Lineker said, the way the government is othering people, it, it has nasty overtones to the 1930s. And at this point, though, I would have rolled my eyes and said, oh, come on, guys, it's nothing like the 1930s. Uh, this is the, art, the artist Sarah Fink, and another one of her beautiful drawings where she's, it's then, is now, and, and, and you know, now is then. It's Walter Benjamin uh, behind a fence. He was in an internment camp uh, in 1939 in France, but this picture, it could be the edge of Europe today. It could be one of the Frontex camps. And as I was talking to people along this journey, you know, the circles are moving, the, the things I research, people tell you things like, Someone just said, oh, do you, I support these guys called Sea Watch in Hamburg. Do you know that they're being prosecuted for saving lives in the central Mediterranean because the EU organization Frontex is no longer rescuing people? And it's obviously a deterrent. They've obviously taken a decision that, you know what, we have to let some people die to put off the rest of the people. And this is where the shadow starts to creep in, the sort of things that we don't like to think about on the edge of our existence and it's, it's experiential so i went experiential again I, I was an experiential am an experiential tour guide taking people to locations and then creating the layers of, of, of history and the significance and meaning of these places here i am on the walk which sarah is uh, drawing on top of my photos i don't know if um she's in the room tonight actually but uh, this is all a work in progress, but she's phenomenally talented. And it's been a revelation for me to see how the visual, someone else's skill set can, can totally bring alive what you're doing because um, some of us are more visual than others. Some of us are very auditory. We love words, we love text. Some of us are very physical. We have to act things out, kinesthetic. And some of us are very visual. And it's been uh, someone who normally does his own thing all the time. It's been an absolute revelation. I'm so pleased to see where we're going with this art. Here's, uh, for example, one of her images of people on. This is the path that Walter Benjamin took, his last trek. He'd already tried to escape from Marseille, from the Nazis, um, because his arcades project in Paris had come about because he'd been forced to flee Berlin in 1933. Uh, early stage fascism and then uh, the Germans invaded France he was briefly interned as were all people uh, all Germans regardless so you had Nazis and Jews and communists and everyone all inside the same camps because as far as the French were concerned and this happened everywhere happened here as well well you're one of them who knows you could be a spy and on this path that Benjamin took and many refugees uh, fleeing the Nazis took. Only a few years earlier, people had gone the other direction, fleeing from Franco. So eventually, I ended up at Benjamin's monument, and I'm not someone who's got a, a particular relationship. I don't, I don't normally react terribly strongly to sculpture, but there was something about this this monument. Um, I was able to stay there for a few days because of a, a bizarre coincidence where uh, after I booked my ticket, uh, some friends said, oh, we're off to um, a little place on the, uh, the Spanish border of France. Uh, I really like, you know, you won't have heard of it. It's like Nowheresville because we have to finish a film. And I said, it's, it's not Paul Boo, if you're French, or I believe the Catalans call it Paul Bao. And they said, uh, yeah, it is. Why? And I was like, that's so weird because I'm going there and we got our diaries out and they were arriving uh, one day before me. So now I not only had this, this hunch, this reason to go uh, to this place to see Benjamin's monument, but I now had uh, somewhere to stay. And is it Goethe that says something like, if you take 
one step towards, as you say, God or the universe, then it takes four steps towards you. But was I finding the story or was the story finding me? I didn't know. But anyway, over the course of a few days, I would go into this claustrophobic monument, which is called uh, the, the Passages that by Danny Caravan. Um, uh, the arcades project is Le Passage uh, in French or Die Passagenwerk uh, in German. And it, it just works on so many levels. And in the show, uh, I talk about, I literally go into it, like um, into the underworld and have a dark night of the soul inside there as all these themes of refugees and resource wars and, and, and prejudice and borders, um, all these things come together and you, you look across the sea there and, uh, you know, I'm there remembering Benjamin in 1940 and I'm looking across the sea and thinking, well, who's out there now, right now on boats, um, you know, dying out there. And then looking across at the hillside and the freight trains that pass as easily as that through borders from Spain into France, disappearing into France and thinking, wow, like goods and freight can move around the world much more easily than, than, than human beings can. So Benjamin, he's great for a quote, isn't he? He's famous all across the world in universities. The catastrophe, the tragedy is that it continues again. There's this Benjaminian idea of history repeating itself uh, rather than this teleological sort of evolution towards a, 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 bright, a brighter and braver future. And I mean, look at this for a quote. There is no document of civilization that is not also a document of barbarism. He could almost be, maybe he is alluding to the shadow, you know, the, the dark side that we often don't like to con contemplate and accept, consider. And there's a headline from the 1930s about German Jews, which you could change the, the changes to Syrians pouring into this country. Um, and it, it's by the Daily Mail and it could still be by uh, the Daily Mail. So it was quite a dark place I was going to. He is Benjamin now superimposed uh, on a boat again by Sarah. And I've, I've stuck, I hope she's okay with this because I've stuck that Rishi Sunak picture in the top right hand corner which when I first saw it I assumed was satire I thought someone had mocked it up um, but they hadn't it was real um, the Union Jacks everywhere the, the, I mean it's yeah if you know your 1930s history the parallel is quite worrying and there's a lot of heavy stuff going on at the time there were um, bills to restrict protest there were, there, were, there were bills going through the Lords at midnight on a Monday when you know, very little scrutiny. Uh, it's not being reported in the media. It's worrying stuff, the undermining of the judiciary, the circumventing of democracy, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights is very much in the targets, in the target, in the, the, the sites of the, of the government. Uh, there's some really heavy stuff going on, not just in our country, but all across Europe, the rise of, of, of fascism. Uh, you know, let's, let's call it what it is. So by this point, I'd stopped very much stopped rolling my eyes as I researched the Benjamin story and compared it to now. I'd very much stopped rolling my eyes at anyone that said, hmm, the 1930s resonances are a little bit worrying, aren't they, Simon? Now, this is Benjamin's favorite picture, the Angelus Novus. And I use this as a motif in the talk because it's a very powerful image. It was by Clee. And Benjamin loved it. And he said it was the angel of history and the image he came up with. And there's me sitting in Faversham, actually, with, the, um, with the brief, his briefcase there. The, um, it's an angel being pushed backwards, right, into the future. And the, the trail, it's leaving a trail of, of accumulated debris and chaos. And it's being pushed against its will. And he says, this storm, this storm that's blowing it, this is what we call progress. And it's a very, very powerful image. Now, I thought I can't leave people here. It's too dark because what happens to Benjamin in that place on the border is what Hannah Aron said was a tragedy that could have only happened on that day. A day earlier, he would have got through. A day later, he would have known not to try. But on that day, the Spanish officials 
Now, I mentioned, by the way, in the introduction, it mentions Casablanca, doesn't it? And in the show, um, I weave that in. If you've seen Casablanca, one of, I personally think, all-time best film. I've loved it since I was a teenager. It's a love story, right? Well, it kind of is. I mean, it is. But it's also a film about refugees, uh, filmed by refugees. And if you remember, one of the key plot devices is the transit visa. If you've ever seen it, you'll remember that the transit visas have been taken from the murdered German couriers, Ugarty, has uh, you know, got some sort of connection to it. Rick hides them in Sam's piano. The Germans don't get them. And these magic pieces of paper mean, you know, life or death. And Rick and Elsa are after them, as is everyone else. There is a real-life parallel. Uh, Marseille, or Casablanca, was just like it was in the film. Spies everywhere, intrigues. People selling themselves, selling anything to get these pieces of paper that determine life or death. And when Benjamin crosses the border over the Pyrenees on that grueling trek that I did myself and found it quite knackering, he's asked if he has this new piece of paper, an exit visa from France. Well, of course, the Nazis are after him. So the French government, Vichy France, is never going to give him an exit visa. And for Benjamin, that's the last straw. He's already tried to escape from Marseille. He's physically ill. Uh, he's spent the night sleeping on the mountainside. He's exhausted. And we were the same age, actually. We were both 48 when we did it. And um, it was the same time of year as well. I was fit and strong. Benjamin was tired, hungry, and fed up. And it was the last straw. And he killed himself. I thought, it's just too, it's a dead end. It's too depressing. Once you take hope from people... If we don't have hope, then we have nothing. So I thought, you know what? The real, the treasure, the gold that I want to take back to people, it's not Benjamin, you know. It's the woman that took him over the mountain. A woman who's relatively unknown. A woman by the name of Lisa Fitko. And I thought, that's what people need. They need a call to action. They need... I don't want to do Benjamin down, but... I was struck by the contrast between he's an older, uh, very cerebral man who dallies when they tell him to get out of Paris. He doesn't. You know, he wants to finish this arcades project, this sprawling project that can never be finished. It can never be finished. Fitco is this young, dynamic woman of action who she's always one step ahead of the secret police. She always escapes from them. The Gestapo come and they're always a day too late. And she saves countless lives, taking them across the mountains, and then she gets out in time, and she makes it eventually to America and the New World, and has a great life. So I thought that is what people need. I've got to leave people with her. So taking the spirit of Fitco, I realised that I'd been had I chickened out of going to Calais when my friends were at the jungle. Or had it just not got around to it, but I was like, you know, I need to do more. Fitco has inspired me. This is me at Calais uh, at Christmas. I'm pulling a face there because uh, I've been spanked comprehensively at chess five times on the trot by these guys who I met there, who are, and this is in a car park on the outskirts of Calais. And by the way, all of those guys are from countries that are at war, uh, like the Afghan guy I met from a country that we talk about a mess we uh, abandoned along with America recently. And then in a, a lovely twist of fate, as we get towards the end here now, it turns out that Lisa Fitko, who had this great quote about fear is no good, guys. We must stand up and make our voices heard. She was from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. She was born in 1909 in a place that is now in Ukraine. And I've been appalled, as on my friend here, David, by what was going on in Ukraine. And I thought, I've got to do something. And I went to the Polish border first. And I was, I'll, you know, I was a little bit intimidated by the idea of crossing the border into a country at war. And some people said to me, oh, you shouldn't do that. No, like a country at war. No way, Simon. And I thought about Fitco and I was inspired by her. And I thought, what would she do? She would go. And so with my good friend, David, here, we raised a few thousand pounds through fitness challenges 
And then we went to Ukraine and we bought supplies in uh, the local areas, only going as far east as, as Kiev. And then we gave them to people like these young women here who very much had the spirit of FITCO about them. Some of them, um, one of those young women was actually going to cellars in Bakhmut where people were living underground, gaunt from lack of vitamin D and giving them food and blankets, you can see there. And we bought some of those food and blankets for them and gave it to them to then take to the front line. This is the Maidan. This is as far east as we went. Uh, we weren't as brave as that young woman. These are flags planted to commemorate all the people. As you can see, Ukrainians killed by Putin. They've got another section nearby, which is uh, foreigners killed by Putin. And I wanted to, and it, and it was the most amazing experience. Both of them were. Calais was, uh, I'm still processing it, so processing it, and so was Ukraine. It was absolutely incredible. Um, and I really felt like I had Fitco with me. And so this this idea of going out on experiences and, and what you look for and what you think you're going for might be different from what you actually find. Um, and of course, in Calais, you know, I was kind of slapped in the face by the realization of just how much your skin color determines your life chances. Someone said to me, you know, there were never any Ukrainians here on the streets of Calais. Just this morning, this email arrived from Sea Watch. That's the Hamburg NGO, the one that was being prosecuted for saving lives in the central Mediterranean. In the first quarter of this year, the flight across the Mediterranean Sea already ended fatally for 600 people. The blame for the deaths in the Mediterranean lies with the total failure, failure of the EU in the matters of sea rescue. What the EU really means by border protection is that refugees should die rather than reach Europe. Uh, here's a text from a friend in March, sirens every day. It could be the Blitz, but it's not. It's Europe now in 2023. And then this idea that we've had Brexit and the power balance in the EU is shifting to the east, whether we like it or not. Poland have embarked on a massive military procurement program under a rising power. The world is changing. The post-1945 settlement, the UN Convention on uh, Refugees, the European Convention on Human Rights, all of these things are being actively threatened right now. Here's something I saw from an intelligence company based in London about tension in the Western Balkans. You saw that I'd been to Mostar and the Western Balkan route has been a key route for refugees. But of course, Bosnia, they didn't fix it. It was just a timeout. And you can see the quote there about tension escalating in the region and the possibility that Putin will encourage Serbian minorities in places like Bosnia to once again open those old wounds and once again to let the specter of rampant nationalism potentially take us into yet more war. So the end of it is, it's a mixed bag, isn't it? because we've got the, the hope and the, the call to action of FITCO, agency, autonomy, doing something, moving, dynamism. You know, it's great to have ideas and reflection, but at some point you have to act. And the notion from Benjamin that possibly history is about to repeat itself. I don't know what the answers are, but I know this is an ongoing journey and the questions I found myself in the middle of are way bigger than someone like me can answer. But hopefully, between us, we can have some interesting conversations and maybe they'll prove helpful as we go forward and negotiate whatever's coming next. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Simon. That was excellent. Uh, the roller coaster, but uh, very topical in today's Europe. Um, uh, I saw. Oh, yeah, Bob is still with us. I saw your question, Bob. But I'm uh, going to ask a few questions first, more specifically about um, so what Simon presented, um, and we do have questions uh, about that as well. Just jump in. But one one thing that I'm wondering is this: we saw a few, uh, few images that you shared that were illustrations um, that you um, made part of the presentation. But th don't the illustrations form part of a, a work that? Uh, you're creating as an output of this kind of journey of yours? Are you making something of a graphic novel? 
Well, possibly. I'm working with Sarah, but she, she works. She's very busy, and I've been quite busy, so it's moving quite slowly, but we're not really sure. I think both of us are exploring. It's new territory, so we're exploring where it might go. I very definitely... Oh, and by the way, I didn't, I didn't show you that I'm wearing... Um, so I'm exploring different ways to get this woman's name out there in front of people, Lisa Fitco, because I think she's a real hero. Um, and... Um, and she's somewhat in the ether as well, actually, because I think Samantha Rose Hill, who wrote about Hassan, Hannah Arendt recently, might be writing about Walter Benjamin, looking at her tweets. And the great aunt of, sorry, the great nephew of uh, Lisa Fitko, he is trying to write a book about her. But of course, he's living in a war zone in um, Ukraine. So I definitely want to do this as some sort of a show um, I mean, the challenge would be to take this to places where it won't be um, received as well as it will be here or in the Barbican or something like that. I think that would be the challenge to go to places where the, the, the message will be a little bit more controversial, you know, that we need to treat people from overseas, um, regardless of skin colour, with compassion and that, you know, all this nationalism might not be a good thing. I think that's the challenge, and I'm, I'm still working out what to do with that. But I think um, Sarah has produced a zine already, uh, which works, and I think is very, very powerful. Um, but I mean, there, there are so many permutations, Baba. Like, for example, I, I'm a tour guide, right? And you've seen how much I've packed in there. I always want to tell everybody everything because I'm like, well, they need to know the whole picture so they can properly understand. But of course, art as I understand it, leaves spaces for people to create themselves, right? And maybe it's a bit... So I want to slap loads of text in to give value for money to people and also to make sure they know how much research we've done. And and Sarah, I think, from the way she approached it, is a bit more poetic. And obviously she has the 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 the, the, the wonderful images that she produces that convey so much without using words. And so we're, we're finding that's a really long way, isn't it, of saying that we're, we're still trying to work that out. Yeah, um, but it leads into a, a, a follow-up question, uh, and that is, or yeah, remark for sure, but maybe a question. It's very, I think, clear what you have chosen for yourself um, is the right way forward to try to make a difference in the same way that uh, the Ukrainian, what was it, Lepo, Sepo? The, uh, sorry, the... Ukrainian lady. Uh, her name oh, yes, yeah, Fitko, F-I-T-T-K-O. Fitko. Yeah. Uh, so, so and to uh, mirror the work that Fitko did, um, and, I mean, this is this is a great testing way to communicate uh, the issues that happened in 1924 and what is happening today. Um, but listening to the, for the recipients, listening to these things, for many of the recipients, will not make them into activists, right? Um, and only listen to your story, and they might leave the theater crying, which is good, because they should cry about what uh, many of the European leaders and countries are doing to these people that try to come into Europe, because they're being kicked out of their own countries because of what these same countries are doing over there. Um, but uh, what do you see? Do you have any ideas as to what what else can we do? What can, what can we do <laughs> uh, to 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 turn this? Votes around. Uh, we can educate ourselves. It's, you know, it's, it's where I get stuck. But um, that requires so much agency from the individual. Is there something that we can convey? Is there somehow that we can convey this agency? Well, I mean, the, the first time I did it at, um, at Faversham, I did actually have a clipboard. And um, I've been thinking about this myself, actually, because it's a great it's a great point, actually, about that. I thought, well, what's the point in so th this is the, my thing about historical tours. If you, if, they, if you don't use that information, then it's just an entertainment, isn't it? So I have actually the first time I did it at Faversham, I had two clipboards and one was for Care for Calais and one was for Channel Rescue. And I said, you can put your name down uh, if you want to volunteer. And I've been thinking about that um, a lot. And I would like, I, I think I will have some sort of mechanism for people to get more involved because otherwise it's like, yeah, you, you G people up and you, you get them kind of like, you know, right, let's do something. Uh, and then it's like, and then if you just 
okay, that's it. Everyone go home now. It does, it does kill the energy. So I think there will be some sort of mechanism for people to get involved. I mean, I, I would like to take this into schools as well, you know, because it addresses questions of citizenship, uh, in, um, you know, critical thinking, um, and also as well, you know, I, I, um, I think it's good for people to join the dots and then even even just having the conversations I think are important because it shows that um, that we're not isolated. We're not the, you know, you're not like, oh, my, I'm glad I'm not the only one who's worried that like this is all eerily familiar, this pattern that, that, that we're seeing. And then, I don't know, like, you, you know, I mean, f that is not the answer on its own, but I think the more, you know, one of the great things you can do at, at is to laugh at these people. And when I see someone in government um, saying something that's just absolutely outrageous and devoid of compassion and, and frankly a little bit, you know, does have, does sound a bit fascistic. And then to see them being uh, ripped apart and schooled on Twitter, um, you know, it's, it's good it's good to know that we're not the only ones on that page. But, but yes, it's a great question. And I think it does have to lead into some sort of mechanism for people to be involved. Yeah, and I get to uh, also take your point on uh, how the narrative um, is shifting without there being enough pushback against this shifting of the narrative. We are accepting more and more extremes because uh, there is too little, uh, as, as a people, because there's too little pushback in mainstream media against jingoistic, fascist statements from our political leaders. It's extremely dispiriting. It's a little bit like um, uh, on, a, on a different level, but with exactly the same, um, or through exactly the same premise, there was this recently in the US, uh, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, uh, uh, I think it was Trump himself, who, who said, oh yeah, I saw him eat pudding with his own fingers. And the next day, Mainstream American media was talking about how Ron DeSantis was keeping pudding his fingers. Who cares? This man is a fascist. <laughs> Address what is what matters, right? Um, uh, you're muted. I mean, one one thing that say maybe I can do for on some little part of what so many other artists and thinkers have done for me, which is just to help me speak. Like you know, like. I, I love it when I go into a show or a talk and I come out and I'm a little bit further down the path and I'm like, man, that's what I kind of intuitively knew or was feeling or had a sense was out there, but I hadn't quite fully joined all those dots or I couldn't articulate it myself. And you just, for example, when you find out a concept like psychogeography and you're like, oh, well, I've been doing that for years. And, and you think these, these sort of idle, oh, isn't this a bit like that? And then you, you think, oh, that's just me. And then you go, oh, actually, no, there's a whole sort of uh, wave of academics and people talking about this. And, and this is a phenomenon. And it even, it's, it's even got a name. Um, and so I, I find that enormously helpful. I've listened to so many talks and, uh, by, and read so much over the years from other people. And it's just, you know, it's like books. They're, they're doorways they're into, into a room. And then in that room, will be a door into another room. And, and so the world opens up for me through ideas and conversations and, and concepts. And sometimes it might even be like a throwaway remark that someone says, like, like in Huddersfield, when I heard the idea of the rhizome um, by, I think it was Jamie McPhee of, of Cumbria University. And then when Elspeth Penfold said, oh yeah, well, you're creating new maps, aren't you? And I was just like, Psh. like oh, I'm not, I'm not just faffing about indulgently pondering my own sort of navel this is a this is a thing you know and and it's quite easy to think to forget that there's, there's the more you learn the more you realize you don't learn and you know a chance conversation with a stranger can just lead you down another tab another rabbit warren and open up a whole network of amazing things but that's that's loads of chat from me i feel like we should open it up to the floor you know because i'd love to hear what other people um think let me respond to, yeah, uh, I'll let you go, Amanda, but I'll, let me respond to what you said by saying that this is just a cycle of with and one thing leads to another and you see where that comes in. Yeah. Not to uh, die walking, but to acquire uh, knowledge. Amanda, go for it. I'm 
and then that doesn't want to go for it. You are not muted, but we cannot hear you. I oh, may. Oh, I, I, I was going. I was going to say to Simon that um, I think it's about how you get people to care enough about something. So, if you think about Fitka, for example, so for most people, they they don't do what you did. They 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 don't go on a journey to be confronted by by those those horrors and wars that are happening somewhere else. They wait for those things to come to them and then they've got no choice but to respond and then think about how they're going to respond, by which time for most people or for a lot of people, it's too late. But it's it's that gap between something, I mean, everybody knows this, right? The gap between something that's not happening on your own doorstep so you don't have to do anything about it and making people care enough or think about it enough to realize that it's actually not that far away from their own doorstep and the time from something happening to someone else and then it starting to happen to you starts to reduce and if you look if you look back at the 30s that took what kind of like five years or something for that to start to happen but I mean for you maybe like what made you start to care enough the fact somehow that one person, and it usually is one person, not like people are not generally affected by a whole group of people because you can't, most people feel that, that they can't help a whole group of people. Most people think that they can help one person and then maybe help one more person and one more person. And most people actually respond to one person much more than they respond to a group of people. And so for you, it was like Fitka that spoke to you. And that's, for me, the, that one person made you care enough to think, what do I do next? Yeah, thanks for that. I'm, I'm noticing, I was looking, looking around for a pen there. I don't have one, but I'm uh, filing it away. Thank you. It, I mean, I, I, I think about action, that in, in the way that people respond to everything. Like, you know, if if someone if someone's being attacked in the newspaper unfairly or on television, and everyone jumps on the bandwagon and follows it and feels that they're not responsible for ruining that person's life, but it's it's the amassing of all those individual people who actually sort of wreck that person's life, and it to me it's the same thing. It's most people group things together as groups and so you're not held responsible but you have to focusing on one person I think kind of really changes things everyone's focusing on Putin but maybe that's not the right person <laughs> to focus on yeah. Bob before you go you had a more conceptual question do you want to throw it in there yep uh, no, uh, in the spirit uh, of oh, I can't think of something completely different to what you're saying, it might, uh, which is your expressed hope, open up the conversation, which is a reflection of our combined differences. The whole being um, bigger than the component parts. So here's the question: My idea is that uh, modernism uh, didn't survive the First World War and the, the black ascetic has filled that suffering space because it's the suffering people. My friend, a conceptual artist, in his latest show in Brussels, has made a fine art mark, I can't quite say it because I can't uh, get the words, but yeah. it's a fine art mark roughly by overlaying gallery shapes, rectangles, and Clement Greenberg said that, it, that it's something finite, it's a mathematical approach. Anyhow, what he's done is restating modernism on the back of the black ascetic. I'm wondering, what's the equivalent in psychogeography? In other words, how does this existential version of modernism, underpinned by the black ascetic, relate to psychogeography? They're completely different things, but I'm just wondering if there's any connection. That's way above my pay grade. Ha um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm I, I'm from Sunderland, you know, I went to Comprehensive, 
uh, and I've uh, been around all the world and, and, and what have you, but that, um, it's too abstract for me. And to be honest, um, where I'm at now, I'm much more interested in, in I'm, I went looking for Benjamin and now I'm more um, taken by Fitco and the idea, idea of direct action. Um, and, and I'm very wary, and I'm, this is not a criticism of, 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 of your question in any way. Um, uh, I'm very, I'm very wary of, in, 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 with a, a nod to the society of the spectacle, spectacle, is that a lot of modern life is very performative. For example, people confuse doing a Facebook post with actually doing something, uh, with actually volunteering or with actually getting their hands dirty. And I, I, you know, it's that balance. We need academia and we need a bit of chin stroking and, and God knows I love a bit of that and I've disappeared at my own backside many a time. Um, but where I'm at right now is I'm much more interested in practical um, application. But maybe somebody else who, who is more au fait with the conceptual side of things can actually, uh, because this is not just about me, there's, there's 10 very smart people in the room, maybe someone else can engage that with, with that in a, a much more constructive and interesting way. Could I just say something quickly? It's, um, what you're doing is exactly the same as what I'm doing in as much as we're talking about reality and actuality. What you're saying is you're concerned with actuality, not with reality, i.e. I, whatever the propaganda is and that sort of thing. So you're doing, you actually do things and I'm actually stating ideas rather than waffling. It might sound like that, but what I'm doing in doing that is presenting something totally different alongside with what you were saying and that was your hope for this session that would open it up by us genuinely, not just different in the way that you could deal with it or understand it, but genuinely different and then bring different points of view together and make it into something, nothing to do with what you said or nothing to do with what I've said, but something bigger than all of us. That's my hope. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't do it um, more justice, right. actually. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else can. Maybe someone else is, um, can, can answer that in a better way that, than I can, or take it, run with it, and make it into something else. Or... And do you want to say something? And he's muted. Oh, what are you saying, me? Type. Sorry. I also, yeah, yeah. My, bat my battery may die. Um, I, that was amazing talk. I was I was fascinated. It's funny. I'm working. A friend of mine. I'm editing a novel for a friend of mine who actually has Walter Benjamin and Lisa Fitko uh, mentioned in the novel. So it's uh, it's a uh, it sort of was like whoa because I hadn't really I hadn't known very much about her and they're kind of minor characters in this plot, but they're there and the route they follow is there and. Uh, it's, you know, exactly it's like, um, but I was thinking a lot, I was very strong. There are many, many things that struck me by what you're doing. Um, but I was struck back and when you were talking about the smugglers and you sort of said you were interested in, you know, these old paths of the smugglers and you have your hat and there's this way that uh, it just made me think about how our tendency as, you know, present people, contemporary people, that we kind of think, oh, we've transcended all this. We've transcended these horrors of the past, and we're going to make them kind of romantic and fun and silly. And um, and even I think we, you know, in my generation, um, I wasn't born that long after World War II, but it seemed like distant memory. And you know, Nazis were just comical to make fun of. Um, and now we, what you're doing is following these roots and saying, well, actually, smugglers still exist, pirates still exist fascists still exist, and these are current threats that have never really gone away. And there's something about, I guess, I don't know what, that exposing that and naming them for what they are, that I think is um, maybe an avenue to think about, like that you, you know, that we're not about um, dressing up in historic costume and pretending this is what the past was like. I mean, even if you go to a place like the Tower of London and every, you know, kids are fascinated by people getting their heads cut off on things like that. Kids love that, but at the same time, it's like, you know, there are people that are getting executed all over the world. 
um, for political who are political prisoners. So I guess it's thinking about how turning these stories, I guess, back into the horror stories they are, and saying that they haven't really ever left us, and now they're new horror stories. That's that was just a thought that uh, your talk inspired me to think about. But very much so. I mean, the the London Blitz springs to mind. The way it's sort of romanticised, and then you you read about the facts, and you read about people with PTSD, and people trekking out to Epping Forest to sleep in the forest because so they're so scared. And the the yeah, the way it's portrayed. I think I think about stuff like that um, a lot. Uh, I had a, a family member once disclose a war crime to me when I was a teenager, and I had to I've had to live with that, and I'm still working out what to do with that and whether to bring it into a piece of work. On or not, um, and and yeah, I mean, I'm very, you know, I read a bit, a bit of Young, and I, I think a lot about the shadow, and I think about the ways. Maybe these are ways um, for us to acknowledge the shadow, and yet somehow keep a distant, a distance from us. So we sort of play at these really quite dark things. Um, and that combined with the other thing, which which I remember being struck as a teenager, I think is, is like, oh well, it's funny how things that happen in the past are bad. We can talk about them, but when they're when they're quite close, like this war crime, for example, we co we can't talk about it. And then and I was like, is it like that childlike thing of like everyone's talking about 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 the world as if bad things can only happen in the past and like oh in the olden days of course bad things happened war crimes happened this happened that happened or and then it's always other people and it's like oh we're always the goodies and it's always like oh other people do bad things like foreign nations their soldiers will do this this and that and then i'd be like but hang on if if everybody's saying that it's someone else who did it and it was never now it was always in the past then how did bad things happen if because <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it just—it doesn't logically didn't hold up. Well, everyone can't be. We're the only good people, and everyone else is bad. But, but anyway, all that stuff doesn't happen anymore. I'd be like, what? And then, of course, and 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 just to go off on a bit of a tangent, um, yeah. The, well, I'm actually the police. Yeah, um, I've got some first-hand knowledge of that. Yeah, exactly. Like, hello, what do we think is happening? Um, and and I was funny enough. I was going to say the whole Me Too thing as well. It's like you, you only had to have some in depth conversations with female friends and girlfriends to to find out. And it was it's just there. It's just so close to the surface. As is, for example, things like fascism, things like exploitation, child labour, and 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 the the way that the global north keeps its foot on the neck of the global south, and all these things like and where the containers come from and what's in it's all there, just just below the surface, and you only have to do a little bit of research and uncovering, but maybe we don't because that's our shadow, and I feel like the camps on the edge of Europe, for example, now I, I sometimes I find myself imagining think you know what we live in a playground. And there's a really brutal world outside there, and we're kept separate from it by ignorance. But if we wanted to know, we could know. And then, in a really dark moment, that make there's that has its analogy in totalitarian regimes of the past, where people knew there were camps at the bottom of the street. And I don't just mean the Nazis, because that one's such an easy thing to reach for. But in any totalitarian regime, you know, people knew there were camps down the road, but there was a collective decision not to um not to not to go there and i've always been i've been you know fascinated by that thing of like but there's some really dark stuff over there and if we don't acknowledge it and we don't talk about it then we can't process it i don't know if that's helpful but the more sorry now i'm doing therapy on i now. sorry about that no i mean it's that's i agree that's the and I think that's the talking about it and if you're an artist, um, there are ways that you feel like that. I think artists have a way of being able to present the shadows. That's part of the calling. And I think what we're talking about is courage. If you think nobody else in the street is mentioning the camp at the end, then you're the only one. But if you hear of the other people that are to start with thinking about it 
and then the one that does step across the line and then the next and the next. What we're doing is collectively building courage. And it takes time because, as you say, the history is we don't talk about it, you know, be, be, be quiet. But but because it is so close to the surface, whether that's the literally the surface, something, a story, a family story that we are about to tell or whether it's the edge of our lands or whether it's you know in our practice the more that happens what's happening is 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 a, is a build up of collective courage and the more that happens the more when you come right up against it you you do open your mouth without thinking because somebody somewhere you've watched them you've heard them do that and you know you you know you're not the only one and i think that's what this is all about and yes it obviously does take time um, because we don't have that history we don't have those role models mostly like Fitco, you know i mean like the very nature of her was that she had to do it secretly so people didn't know about it but the more this happens the more the collective courage will will build i'm sure of it I sometimes I've done a, a lot of quite a few walks on Mary Wollstonecraft and I'll sometimes refer to her as the awkward person in the room you know the one person that's stand up and go actually guys this is not okay is it and you pay a, you you know you pay a price for that if you're in the minority which these people usually are aren't they but well lovely put thank you that's um that's really useful thank you Thank you, Simon. Um, then maybe uh, on the, this somewhat positive note is where we should uh, think about slowly wrapping up. Um, we haven't heard from Joanna yet. Joanna, do you want to throw in a few words? Sorry if I put you on the spot. Uh, hi. First of all, thank you, Simon, for for your account. It is moving, and uh, and it, uh, I think that uh, as Anna was telling, was saying that it's really interesting the way that some figures that are in the past and that you are naming, that you are finding them again now and naming them. And when you do that as a narrator, as a history teller, I think that's, that's really important. It's, of course, that really acting within the things that's important, but naming things, making them present in this discourse, it's really a massive thing. And it's something that Benjamin would also uh, defend, the importance, the importance of naming, naming the ones that are forgotten. That's a way of taking them back and maybe... Um, giving giving them some respect and dignity and that that's that's something that you are doing and you're also in this even i don't know if you knew about this on benjamin siri but you are you are taking that with you again even uh, that now you are really interested and it was really amazing to know and i didn't know about that woman um lisa fitka that uh, and her importance um, on uh, helping people to to uh, move uh, and uh, going away from the Nazis. But uh, I would say that naming, naming, and identifying those, uh, um, you know, the new pirates, the fascists, the smugglers. That's really, really really important thing uh i think i would go with this thank you well um because we, i didn't give you the the full story so on his mon maybe you know this already but on his monument it actually has one of his quotes which is something like it's far harder it's far more arduous to um construct the history of the unknown of the little person but that is the job of the historian but you knew that didn't you yeah and and i and, and one of the the things i was struck by is that you know i went looking for benjamin but in the end i was looking out to sea and thinking about all the unknowns and and the the benjamins that we would never know like who knows that in that dinghy maybe there was someone who was was 
you know, um, would, did have this famous missing manuscript that would be life changing, like Benjamin was supposed to have in his, in his briefcase. But then also flipping that around and asking the question of um, who, whose lives matter? Is it to the lives of, of people like Benjamin? Um, do, do only they matter? Like Anne Frank, like someone, someone once said, you know, I know this is all very sensitive stuff that said, well, what about the, 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 the people who died in the Holocaust that weren't, some of them probably weren't very nice people, but does that mean their lives are not as important as, as the, and it, it raises in quest, interesting questions, isn't it, about who, who we care about, who our compassion goes to, and, and yes, um, the, the, the little people, and um, I think that about, about that a lot, because we talk about a lot in, and it, about exceptional people in history, and you know kings and queens and p the people that go on statues and you know um, I, I, I did an alternative statue tour where I said, well, what about some statues of just of, of like ordinary people? What about maybe some nurses? Um, and you know, there's, there's some incredible history in my own family, and we're all just ordinary people. Um, but yeah, um, that's um, thank you for saying that. And I will think there is a power. I think you're right. There is a power in in yeah saying, look, this is this is there's an elephant in the room, and pointing to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Simon, and thank you all for uh, sticking around. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, pull it quits. Uh, Bye -bye. Have we got one? Have we got one minute? Could I ask just very quickly? Can Absolutely. anybody put, can anybody tell me what I'm doing? Because I still, I kind of know it's, I know I'm doing something, but I still can't quite say what it, is it storytelling? Is it, is it walking artistry? Is it, what is it? Because I might have to do a grant application one day and I'll need to call it something. And don't worry if we can't, but if anyone's just got a quick, well, it's this, isn't it? Arts Council Category 5C, General Faffing. Well, um, I also have no name for it, but um, what I think, uh, what kind of describes that uh, walking art, well, what I think what kind of describes what you're doing is that you're living the art. Yeah? You're, yeah, you're living putting history. your, yeah. yeah, you're putting, not your money, but your, your, what you do is what you say, and what you say is what you do. Uh, and it's not uh, that you do this as a politician, you do it as a person who, who, who um, um, acts, you, you go to Ukraine and you do these things. So that's not, that's not art, that's not walking art. Or is it, right? Because you're doing it for the reasons that you describe based on things that were previously triggered that are very much of your performance and your investigation and uh, what you learned through the expansion. Um, and then you live this. Right, um, but I, I fear that might be hard to get grants for. It's, you know, <laughs> what, what I think matters is that you, what I think matters for you is that you're doing it. Mm. That I think is important, and and I have a suspicion that there will be more people like this, mm. uh, because I because I think there is much more. There might for some people uh, like yourself. There is, I suspect, much more satisfaction in living this process mm -hmm. than uh, than writing about it or talking to people about it. No, actually, doing it mm. uh, is uh, much more satisfactory, uh, and also it makes a difference. And when you're an activist, which you clearly are, that's what matters. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. So, well, hold on. Uh, you yourself said artivist. I, it, it's really interesting to end with that, Simon, because like, like it was it Joanna who said that you know you've got to you you've got to name something, right? So you're looking to <laughs> you're looking to move, to name yourself before you can actually continue. With okay, her. we're going to make artivism part of the uh, part of Wikipedia. Somebody's going to edit the name. We're all going to edit it. Yeah, his art, art history act. No, historical act. No. Artivism. Thank you. Well, I'll leave you with Lisa's quote. There it is. We can't be afraid. You could call your, You could refer to it as think, thinkism. How about that?
Finkism. F I N K I S M. Oh, I'll think about that. So we're left with a, a question to ponder. That's very good. Um, then, uh, before we all go, I am going to tell you that our next event uh, is on the 2nd of May. It is uh, around writing and walking, and it will be hosted with uh, Linda Cracknell, or Cracknell, uh, English is not very good, and uh, uh, Andrew Stuck, who is uh, currently uh, performing in Vienna. But Vienna is not as nice as Budapest comes in. Budapest is much nicer. Even though their political situation is, of course, much worse. <laughs> yeah. What is much worse? The, pol the political situation in Hungary. Uh, yes. It's a mess. Yeah. There's actually, okay, I'll let, let, leave you with a little anecdote about how uh, personal activism is needed, specifically also in Hungary, because in the Hungarian constitution, it now says that a family is headed by a man and a woman. That is a family. You cannot have a family of uh, two men, two women. That is a not constitutional in Hungary. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'll end on a negative note. I'm sorry. Let's go back. <laughs> chilling. Very oh, chilling, I, yes. <laughs> Thanks again, guys. Uh, I hope to see you in a few weeks. And Simon, uh, well, uh, I'm looking forward to the next product of your creation, or the, 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 the completion of your product, of uh, your creation. Oh, Lovely. Thank you. thank you so much for everyone. Um, and for... Um, uh, I sometimes say to people, because people don't realize that uh, when you give someone your attention uh, in the way you have done, that is also a gift. So thank you for coming and giving me your time and attention and energy and care. Um, it's very much appreciated. Thank you.